I'm certainly excited to be here with this uh, distinguished group of panelists. And really what I hope that you will hear from us by the time we're done is that businesses, governments, non-governmental organizations are all engaged in trying to find solutions to this problem that we're collectively facing. And that we can't come across uh, solving this problem in a single way. And so you're going to hear about innovation today. We're even going to give you the opportunity to ask questions about innovation. We'll tackle some tough questions amongst ourselves, and hopefully that'll all be valuable to you. Let me start with the HP perspective. HP is in the information and communication technology industry. And that industry globally causes about 2% of the world's carbon footprint. And so we're very aggressively working to reduce our impact and reduce the carbon that's emitted when all of us here in this room use information and communication technology. But there's also a big challenge. That other 98% about the footprint has great opportunities for solutions that come from or are enabled by information and communication technology. And so we're excited to really work this issue from both sides from a Hewlett-Packard perspective. And as the world's largest information technology company, we have a big obligation to be a big part of that solution. But we also have an opportunity presented because of our scale, because of the size of our company, because of the size of our supply chain, because of the size of many of the customers that we do business with, we have a unique ability to look out there and say, where are the solutions possible? What are the solutions? We even ask our customers, what are the business problems that you're facing and how can we find solutions to them using information and communication technology? And so when HP approaches this challenge, our strategy has three elements. And the first is we want to optimize resources. How do we fundamentally use less? Whether it's less materials, less electricity, whatever it is, how do we use less and then how do we help our customers use less? Secondly, how do we build intelligent infrastructure? How do we put sensors or put intelligence into business processes that exist today and make them more intelligent? And I'll give you some examples of that. And lastly, and the most exciting thing for me, how do we drive sustainable transformation? exactly the things that Dennis was just talking about. And when we think about the business challenge that we want to try to solve, we can put ICT to work to fundamentally change those processes. Let me start with the example there. As Dennis mentioned, a lot of times people get on aircraft and or uh, governments or customers come to us and they want to find more efficient flights, when what they really want to do is conduct a face-to-face -face meeting. They're not necessarily interested in getting on an aircraft to do it. They want to conduct a face-to-face -face meeting in high definition and in real time with no lag. And so one of the examples that HP invented is a solution called our visual collaboration technology where we have visual collaboration studios where up to four groups of people from around the world can meet face-to-face -face in real time yet never get on an aircraft to do it. It's a very immersive technology. I've had it be so immersive with journalists that I'm interviewing with that they actually reach out and try to shake my hand, yet they're half a world away. And every one of those studios saves HP about 230 tons of carbon per year per studio. And we're so excited about using them ourselves that we've quadrupled the number of studios we have, and our customers are pretty excited about those as well. So that's just one example of how when we focus on what we actually want to accomplish, ICT can play a huge role. Our HP labs, our research and development arm, has invented what they call Central Nervous System for the Earth, or SENSE. And that's a technology that consists of very small wireless sensing devices that can sense motion, or can sense gas, or can sense all sorts of other attributes and all of a sudden, that enables us to fundamentally transform a process. Think of any of you that live in an area that's earthquake prone. When you have an earthquake, teams of engineers and government officials go inspect buildings and bridges. Yet with sense, if you had the sensors already on the bridge or the building, you would know exactly what loading 
that built bridge or building took during the earthquake event and whether that was outside the structural norms of that, for example. And these sensors, if you want to get a sense of how sensitive they are, they're about a thousand times more sensitive than a Wii controller. So they're very, very small, they're wireless, but yet very, very accurate. And that fundamentally transforms how we then can interact with our environment. And the vision of HP Labs is to have a global network of these. So we're committed to reducing the energy efficiency of our products. We're committed to helping our customers use less. But as HP, we're also committed to fundamentally having more sustainable, transformative solutions that we can bring to market for our customers that will make significant differences in reducing the carbon footprint that each of us have on the globe. And so with that, I'm actually going to challenge our panelists as each of them describes what their company or their organization is doing from a sustainable transformation perspective to share a little bit with you. And then, as I mentioned, we'll challenge each other with some questions and hopefully that will create new ideas and opportunities for you as well. This morning, we're going to start with Brent Constance, seated right to my right. Brent is the founder and chief executive officer of Calera. Brent? Thanks. Uh, I want to say I really admire all the energy efficiency solutions that all the companies here are presenting uh, for their individual contribution. I'm going to be focusing more on uh, what I think the large companies of the future are going to be. And I think most of those companies don't exist today. Um, and I think these will be global companies that impact carbon worldwide. I think we're really looking at gigaton opportunities, companies that will have effects on four, five, six, seven, eight gigatons of CO2 per year and what they're doing. And those opportunities exist in areas like coal-fired power generation, um, where we really need to bring coal itself beyond carbon neutral to a carbon negative technology because it's inevitable that coal is going to be used for electrical power generation. Um, and I think these solutions will be cross-sectoral solutions. For example, at Calera, we take from electrical power generation from coal and convert it into concrete. Uh, coal, coal generates 7 or 8 billion tons, gigatons of CO2 a year for electrical power generation. And the production of concrete uh, also produces about 3 billion tons. And by replacing those two, uh, that's the kind of significant impact that I think the large organizations of the future are going to have. Th these are often disruptive. And in, in our case, we produce enormous amounts of potable water in this process and reduce billions of tons of mining altogether. So it's crossing mining, water, cement, power, all in one ac economic activity, which which really uh, isn't dependent on a, a subsidy uh, or a taxation in any way. It's simply an economic activity. I think history shows us, if you look at the large incumbents, they're, they have set business models within their sectors. And they aren't set up for multidisciplinary, cross-functional um, interactions. Uh, you know, I'm from Silicon Valley, and we, we look at AT&T and IBM. And you know, the McKinsey report in 1980 that led IBM to divest their cell phone business said there might be a, a, you know, a million cell phones by uh, 1990. Well, that they had a huge cell phone, and they, there just wasn't the vision to see what was going to happen with cell phones or, or AT&T. Uh, same thing happened. Companies like Cisco, Juniper, Google, Facebook just didn't, didn't exist. And uh, so it was impossible to extrapolate what we knew back then to what actually happened. And I think in, in, in carbon chains, we're really looking for a black swan that's going to come along. At Calera, we, we see CO2 as a resource, uh, not another pollutant that can be dealt with like cap and trade. It's a huge resource. It's a raw material for what we're doing. Look at the Great Barrier Reef. It's, it's got hundreds of billions of tons of CO2 sequestered. It's the largest biological structure on the planet, and it's a, a process very similar to what we use. And, and we make carbon negative products, and that's really where the future is going to be, is it won't be enough to simply reduce the amount of carbon, but we need to go carbon negative. 
and for, for governments and legislation, what's needed are policies that, innov that really promote innovation. For example, just a low carbon standard, one that's not technology specific or choosing a winner. Just technologies that are, are not only low carbon, but carbon negative and promoting those. I think that's really where the future is going to be. Great. Thanks, Brent. Next, we're going to hear from, very briefly, from James Thompson, the Chief Financial Officer of EcoSecurities. James? Thank you. I'll try and make it brief. Uh, uh, just a quick word on EcoSecurities. We work in the, uh, in the CDM market. Our role is working with uh, project developers uh, and making the issuance of, of carbon credits happen. Uh, we allow com the project developer to hedge, and we allow the project developer to monetize the, uh, uh, the carbon. We've sent over 100 million euros over the uh, 12, I think, years that the company's been around. We developed the first uh, carbon offset certification system. Uh, we registered the first project with the, uh, the CDM under the Kyoto uh, protocol. Um, we also had the project which had the first uh, issuance. We've now went past 200 projects in January of, uh, of this year. Just looking at um, public and private uh, funding in adaptation and mitigation, public and private funding has very different risk uh, return profiles. The risk we're talking about is uh, the risk associated with a forward revenue stream uh, to pay back and give a return on initial investment. Without good visibility of that revenue stream, uh, private finance isn't going to be forthcoming into a market. Within the market for mitigation and adaptation, there is a huge range of risk return profiles. And there's uh, equally between uh, public and private, as I said, different profiles. So let each uh, type of funding uh, address the, uh, the appropriate uh, part in the uh, mitigation or adaptation. The introduction of market structures can change the risk return profile. Um, and uh, it can move a situation from a, a, a part where purely uh, public funding would be applicable into where private funding might be. For mitigation, the CDM is a case in point. The creation of this market is fundamentally uh, based on the limits set uh, on uh, Annex 1 countries, which has created demand, which has put a price on, uh, put a price on carbon. Uh, for adaptation, the introduction of a market is nothing like so easy. Uh, what are you putting a, a price on? Is it the stopping of desertification, uh, the flooding of farmland, or even the flooding of homes? Overall, that would involve putting a, a price on uh, human suffering. How to set up a market? I mean, markets which are where private finance operates uh, don't generally need encouraging. Uh, they don't need capacity building. They work and they work well as long as the structure is correct. You can just let them get on with it. If you want to uh, encourage private finance, then you should spend the time up front engaging with private finance to the planning stage to make sure that you get the structures right. For private money to be invested, though, you have to have a, uh, uh, an efficient market. The cap and trade system is good because it is, uh, we know that the objective will be achieved. Um, but we should, however, take note of some of the lessons that we've learned from the first, uh, first phase of the CDM. And also be aware that private finance is looking at the sector, how it currently works, and how learning and good intentions are maybe not enough, and might be more sceptical for the next time. The hurdle rate for re-entering the market is perhaps high, higher now, given, we've, given that we've seen how it operated in, in reality. And also, if we want to have a desire for a better system next time, a desire perhaps for able uh, private funding to be more uh, front-end loaded uh, with revenues to allow uh, for proper carbon financing. Uh, 